everybody. Uh, welcome to our briefing today. I'm Dan Brissett, President of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And we have a really great briefing lined up to talk about the Sustainable Energy in America Factbook 2023. Um, before we uh, get to our speakers and our panelists, I just have a couple things I'd like to begin with. Um, the first is by a big shout out to um, Representative Paul Tonko and his staff for helping us be here today with the room. So thanks very much, Representative Tonko. Um, your staff is always incredible to work with to uh, bring educational opportunities to Capitol Hill. Um, ESI is uh, based here in Washington. We are focused on policymaker education about climate change topics. We also have developed expertise over time, uh, helping uh, utilities in rural areas access federal resources to provide inclusive on-bill financing for their customers. Uh, we do lots of different stuff when it comes to policymaker education. We have briefings like this. This is actually our fifth briefing already in 2023, and we have several more lined up, actually many, many more uh, lined up in the coming weeks. Uh, we also have a really great newsletter. It comes out every two weeks. It's called Climate Change Solutions. And if you're interested in learning more about what we do at ESI and keeping up with all of our briefings and our written materials, I really can't recommend subscribing to that enough because it is really great. We have some good stuff coming down the pike, too. Um, for example, next week is the first of our Farm Bill briefings of the year. Uh, on March 23rd, we'll be working with the Natural Resources Defense Council on a, briefings about, a briefing about organics and that will be really, really excellent. We also have some really great fact sheets coming on, uh, including one about EV trucks, uh, which should be really cool. Um, and we also uh, do reports and FAQs and, and things like that. And the best way to keep up with that is by subscribing to our newsletter. And you can do that by visiting us online, online at www.esi.org. And while you're there, uh, some subscribe to our other newsletters and follow us on Twitter and other social media at ESI online. Um, I uh, am really, really looking forward to this session because this is one of the, um, this is one of the resources that I use a lot uh, when I'm trying to remember <laughs> where things stand in terms of the transition uh, to a decarbonized clean energy economy. The Sustainable Energy Factbook is a really extraordinary resource. We have a great in-person, I didn't do that. Uh, we have a great uh, in-person audience today, but we also have an online audience, and uh, everyone's going to hear a lot of really great information. For people in the room, if you have a question, save it till the end, and we'll have a roving microphone so you can ask your question. If you're in our online audience, you can also ask us a question, and we'll do our best to incorporate that into the discussion. You can send us an email, and the email address to use is ask at esi.org, A-S-K. Uh, you can also follow us online on Twitter, at ESI online, and ask us that way. And now I get to introduce the first of our speakers today, Ethan Zindler, head of America's Bloomberg NEF. Uh, Ethan manages the company's analyst and commercial teams in New York, Washington, San Francisco, and Sao Paulo. Uh, he serves as Bloomberg NEF's primary spokesperson in North America. He's also a senior associate non-resident at the Center for Strategic and International Studies Energy and National Security Program. Ethan holds an MBA from Columbia Business School and a bachelor's degree from Georgetown. Ethan, welcome to the lectern. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Dan, uh, and thanks EESI for, um, for this opportunity. Again, it's great to be back here. Um, and of course, thanks to uh, Business Council for Sustainable Energy for partnering with us on this important work. And you're gonna hear from Lisa Jacobson in a few minutes. So thanks to Lisa and Laura and the whole team there for supporting this project. This is the 11th year that we have done the Sustainable Energy in America Factbook. Uh, every year brings new and interesting surprises. And uh, this year uh, was no different in that regard. Um, but um, it was the least weird year, I guess we could say, of the last three, given what we've been through um, with COVID. Um, but there were some pretty um, unusual challenges uh, that were less COVID-oriented and more specific to the energy sector. Uh, and those who are in the energy business can, can sort of attest to that. Uh, the first major, really major land war in Europe that we've had since World War II, um, continuing recovery from COVID uh, in terms of the effect on supply chains, um, higher energy costs, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, and these things really had some substantial effect on the, the broader transition to lower carbon sources of energy across the U.S. economy. Um, so it, well, it was like kind of less weird out in the real world for normal people, people going back to work and things like that. Uh, in our world of energy, it was, uh, it was a tumultuous year. Uh, and so I've titled this Hardwired into U.S. Growth because the main point of one of the main points that we try and make in the report is 
Um, even despite these unusual circumstances in the energy industry, we continue to see a lot of progress uh, in, this, in the broader energy transition towards newer, more sustainable energy technologies. Uh, and I'm going to try and show you a little bit about that uh, right now. First, though, let's start with a little background on last year and why I said it was kind of a weird year uh, or an unusual year uh, in the world of energy. This is just a glance at the price of natural gas. And, and the reason I'm showing it is because natural gas uh, isn't the most important factor in setting electricity pricing uh, in the United States today. Uh, about 40% of our power now comes from gas. Um, it's had an enormous role in helping to decommission a lot of coal fire generation uh, in the U.S. overall. And so it's something, uh, it's something really critical to thinking about the economics uh, of energy in the United States. And in general, the U.S. has had relatively low natural gas prices for quite some time. The, the left-hand chart is basically the wholesale power, the, excuse me, the wholesale natural gas price. And then the right-hand side, you see different prices for residential, commercial, and industrial pricing. Overall, Americans have basically been blessed with low price natural gas for some time now. Uh, last year, we saw an uptick in those gas prices pretty sharply. Uh, and a, a big part of the reason for this, of course, was the events uh, in Ukraine um, and additional demand that was, that was placed on the U.S. gas system to uh, provide more exports to Europe uh, and elsewhere. It is important to kind of asterisk the note that natural gas prices have actually since come down, and they're, they're about somewhere between 2 and $3 per million BTU now at Henry Hub. But for a good part of last year, they were up, and that had a lot to do with the Burr macro scene within energy in the United States. There were other areas, though, where we saw prices uh, go up as well that were really quite germane uh, to specifically to renewables and to electric vehicles. So first of all, steel costs for wind, uh, which are used, you know, typically used in, in, in wind turbines, those were up. This is, these charts, each one of the ones that I'm going to show you here is rebased essentially to zero, so you can kind of see them uh, on an equalized basis. If you look at some of the key inputs used in solar equipment, uh, particularly polysilic polysilicon, the yellow line, you can see how much that jumped last year. Um, if you look at some of the key inputs into lithium-ion batteries, um, those, some of those are almost literally off the chart here in terms of the kind of spikes that we saw last year. And then finally, just the general cost of shipping anything um, was up last year, but then did drop towards the end of the year as some of these bottlenecks were unclogged. But across the value chains, as we talk about wind, solar, and, and batteries used in electric vehicles, there was a lot of cost pressure and a, and a kind of weird year in terms of the ups and downs that you see here. Similarly, when we look at the actual prices that consumers and others are paying for electricity, you can see that those prices rose. The Texas spike, of course, is, is a reflection of the very unusual year that they had a couple of years ago. You can see that that re recovered after that. Uh, but nonetheless, you can see wholesale power prices rose last year. Resale power prices, which tend to lag, were more slowly in terms of rising. But wholesale in particular, again, natural gas prices tend to drive electricity, wholesale electricity prices in the U.S., and you can see why those rose last year. So one of the big stories that we've told for years about this energy transition, and which I still think is generally true, is that the transition to these newer technologies usually has meant lower cost energy. Last year, things got a bit off track on that, but nonetheless, we continue to see really important progress. And there's some signs already here into 2023 that the 2022 story of higher costs is already starting to come to an end. One area where higher costs benefited a technology in particular was when we think about electric vehicles. So this is just a very simplified look at the cost of essentially a cost per gallon of filling your tank um, with electricity, that's the yellow line, um, versus filling it with fossil fuels. And you can see because of the higher prices that we saw for petroleum, for gasoline products, how much those prices went up. And even though there was a jump in electricity prices, even at the retail rate, is still on a per gallon basis much less expensive to essentially fill your battery with, uh, with a charge than it is to fill your tank with gasoline. Uh, and on the right hand side, you can see the growth that we've seen in electric vehicles. So last year, uh, about 1 million EVs were sold in the United States, or I should say 1 million cars with plugs in it were sold in the United States. That's both pure electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. Uh, a real surge from the year before, where we were up at about, we were about 600,000, 650,000 the year before. You can see who the biggest sellers are. No huge surprise. Tesla is still the biggest seller, but a number of new names that are much more active in the market now in, in, in manufacturing and producing 
very appealing vehicles that are, uh, you know, reaching out to more vehicle to more uh, buyers. To give you a sort of sense of context, that's about seven percent of all new cars that were sold in the United States last year had a plug in it. Um, for some context, the number was about 30% in China last year, where they sold about 5 million EVs. Uh, in Europe, it was probably somewhere around 20% overall. So we are, we are not uh, leading in this regard. Um, but what we at BNEF have seen is that when markets sort of hit that kind of 10% adoption rate, they, the, the growth continues pretty sharply um, thereafter. And so we seem to be on that trajectory now. One other thing to say just about cost before I talk about renewable build is um, I've shown you a bunch of things, uh, but the, the thing to keep in mind is like when you think about the cost competitiveness of clean energy technologies versus their sort of fossil competitors, while we saw the prices go up for polysilicon and for some of the other inputs that go into solar and wind, for instance, we saw the prices also go up for buying natural gas. So as all costs rise, you can see on this chart here of levelized costs, there's still a gap between renewables and coal, which is the black line on the top, and now a bit of a bit further gap between renewables and natural gas. Uh, and we at BNEF have tried to make the point for a long time that renewable energy represents the lowest cost technology in many parts of the world. Not everywhere, let's be clear, but many parts of the world um, today. And you can see that the gap is, has actually gotten a little bit wider in some cases uh, over the last year. All right, so what does that mean in terms of actual stuff getting built onto the grid that's renewable energy? This is just a, a glance back to 2018, 2019. Um, and you can see that the U.S. market in terms of new wind and solar build was somewhere at a plateaued level of about 20 gigawatts of new capacity being built per year with a bit more solar than wind uh, being built each year. Then we saw this big step up in 2020, uh, up to 36 gigawatts. And since then, we've been, we've been more or less in that zone of the 30, you know, 32 to 37 gigawatts of total build. Uh, a big part of the jump that we saw in 2021 was around solar when 24 gigawatts of capacity was built, you can see here. Um, last year was, was uh, frankly, even though over 20 gigawatts of solar was built, it was a challenging year for the solar industry. There were some pretty sub substantial tie-ups in the first half of the year related to tariffs on equipment uh, imported from overseas countries. It's, that's an issue maybe the panel will talk about, not fully resolved, but essentially uh, put on hold for a while. Um, but that made it very challenging for developers to get uh, equipment into the U.S. that they needed in a timely fashion. And that pushed down both the total number, but also the number that we were forecasting and others were forecasting for a solar build last year, and a smaller overall number in terms of the amount of renewables that were built uh, last year. Um, to give some kind of context for these numbers, you're seeing you know, 30 gigawatts per year. The total U.S. power system is about 1,100 gigawatts, somewhere in that neighborhood. So this is a pretty small percentage of that total overall. In terms of what it means uh, to try and get towards a goal, and the, the, Biden, the Biden administration has said that they want to entirely decarbonize the U.S. power system by 2035. Um, 35 gigawatts, whatever the number is, if you're in the 30 to 35 number, that is about half of what you need to be building every year if you want to get to that kind of a target. So the market uh, is, is big and it's, it's a lot bigger than it was. It's grown really spectacularly over the last 10 years. But if you want to actually get to decarbonization, true decarbonization, a lot more work needs to be done. And I haven't even talked about batteries because I got about five more minutes. So, but that's another, that's a whole other area that needs to accompany all that build of renewables. I'll just talk about money for a moment here. Um, and note that last year, globally, we at Bloomberg NEF counted over $1.1 trillion of new investment that went into energy transition technologies last year, uh, which was a, a spectacular figure, blew, blew away the prior record that we had counted, which you can see on the left-hand chart there. On the US side, it was about $140 billion in new capital that went into this area overall. So you know, something like a little, little over 10% uh, of the total. If you want to contextualize that a bit, though, let's, in this I know is the interest for many policymakers, let's compare China versus the United States. So about half of that 1.1 trillion was China. That's what you're seeing on the left. And again, about 140 billion was in the United States. So again, a record year for us in the US, but we are definitely not the world leader when it comes to attracting uh, new investment in the sector. 
Where we are in terms of what kind of energy we're consuming on the power sector, just to be clear, we're now at a point where about 40%, as I said earlier, of our power needs are met by natural gas. But renewables hit a new record last year at about 23%. That's this. That bit up there. And basically, almost all of that growth that we've seen in renewables over the last 10 years has been from the contributions of wind and solar, plus other technologies like geothermal, biomass, and others. But primarily, it's been wind and solar that have added the most. I'm going to keep moving relatively quickly just to say, say something that you guys all know. The Inflation Reduction Act, massive sort of earthquake of policy uh, happening for, for our sector last year. The most important piece of legislation, at least in my view, ever passed to address climate change and support uh, energy transition technologies. I'm sure the panel will have more to talk about on this, but, uh, but it is one of the great stories of 2023 to see how this gets uh, implemented in all of its various forms. And of course, it came on top of the passage of the infrastructure law the prior year. All right, let's finish just by talking about emissions for just a second, because in some ways, as we think about addressing climate change, that is kind of the bottom line. What kind of progress are we achieving uh, at this point? Um, and last year was an interesting year on emissions. So first of all, not too surprisingly, on that left-hand side, as you see total greenhouse gas emissions, and you see this is just emissions from the, from the energy sector, there's this giant divot, which I think you can all guess was, was COVID. Uh, and then there's this bounce back that was into 2022, which was sort of expected as well. And then last year, we saw emissions rise, I think, about, by about 1% year on year, which is this, this last little bit um, over here, um, which is interesting because, uh, you know, I guess if you're looking for the, the best news, there's never great news about emissions continuing to go back up. But uh, we're still well, we're now below 2019 levels. And there's a pretty good chance that we'll never get back there again at this point. Um, and the economy, you know, grew last year at, a, at an at a, not an outstanding clip, but a decent clip overall, and only 1% growth in CO2 emissions. If you look under the hood, though, there's also some interesting things worth noting. So it wasn't that long ago that the power sector was the number one contributor to CO2 emissions. That's the red line there on the right-hand side. Um, that is no longer the case. Not only is power sector not, no longer number two as it was, but you could argue it's, it's essentially tied for second or third place with industrial emissions. Uh, and this certainly raises the sort of profile here of the industrial sector and the long-term need to decarbonize things like steel and cement making, where we've really basically made almost no progress whatsoever, even though we are rapidly decarbonizing the power sector. And finally, where does this leave us towards you know, hitting overall emissions goals? Um, the, uh, the Biden administration uh, has pledged to cut uh, emissions by 50 to 52% by 2030. There's also the Paris target of cutting CO2 emissions 26 to 28% um, by 2025. And if you look at where we are on that, we were, thanks to COVID, sort of heading onto a nice trajectory. Click another year or two, a couple of years forward, and you can see we're no longer really on that path. And then when you, th sorry, and this is the COVID drop. If you think about 2030 and the kind of emissions decline that we need to see, it's a sharper uh, decline. And I guess the only last thing I'll say is that the power sector, you could argue, is now really doing its part to reduce its emissions as we see this move away from coal and towards natural gas and towards, uh, towards renewables in particular, which is zero carbon, while nuclear holds steady. Uh, the transportation sector, we think we can actually start to see some progress um, you know, with a, new, a million new EVs on the road as of the end of last year and sales scheduled to rise this year. But we need to see more progress in other areas if we're going to have any chance of trying to hit this 50% cut by 2030. So a lot of really great progress achieved last year, and a lot of signs that this, that this energy transition, as we tried to say, is hardwired into the way the U.S. economy now operates, but clearly some, some need for some further progress. Uh, ahead. So with that, I want to just welcome Lisa up and say thanks again to Lisa and to everybody uh, for hearing me for a few minutes. Change over. Um, great. Well, thank you, Ethan. Excellent, challenging, kind of, you know, there's a lot in there to unpack, which I'm hoping to do right now with our panel. Uh, before, before I do, I just want to take a moment and thank um, our partners 
EESI. I mean, it really is an honor to work with EESI. We work here at home on federal education and policy development. We also work internationally. I'm really pleased with our partnerships when we go and attend uh, far off uh, meetings of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, just this last year, we had the opportunity to partner on our booth together. And I know for those that are here in the room and online at our booth when I sat there, you know who came over? People saying, where are the EESI people? You know, you have a very strong uh, global following and it's because of this excellent content that you put together. So we're really privileged to be able to, to partner with you on this event each year. Um, the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, for those that might not be familiar with us, we are an energy trade associations. We were founded in 1992 by executives in the energy efficiency, natural gas and renewable energy sectors. They came together because they knew they had readily available clean energy technologies to offer, to offer for the environment, to offer for our economy, um, to offer for our energy security and competitiveness. And all of those things are the same. What has changed is the fact that we now represent many other industry sectors and those sectors are working together in the marketplace. So a lot of leadership from U.S. energy companies. And right now, our frame is how do we move forward with the energy transition? So resources like the fact book really help us know where we've been, where we are now, and then looking at some of those graphs where we need to get. And then we can roll up our sleeves, uh, work on public-private partnerships, work with all of you here on Capitol Hill to adopt policy. So that's who we are. Um, I'd like to take a moment and thank the sponsors of this project. They're listed here. We could not do this work and commission this report um, from Bloomberg New Energy Finance without their support. So, so thank you. And now I'd, I'd love to invite up our panelists. So please, I'll, I'll introduce you in a moment, but take a moment in my last uh, couple of comments here to come and join up here um, on the panel stage. So um, as our panelists are coming up, I just wanted to thank again EESI and their entire staff for their excellent work all year long and helping to put this together. And I also wanted to acknowledge the BCSE staff that's here. We, I, I know online you might not be able to see them, but I'd love to acknowledge Ruth McCormick, who's our Vice President of Federal and State Affairs. She's with us today, as is Laura Tierney, our Vice President of International Programs. Lizzie Strickland, who are, is our communications manager, and Avery Bernstein, who is our program associate. So thanks to all of you for all this work. Yeah, okay, well, let's applaud EESI and BCSE together. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, just the last thing to say uh, before I turn to the panel is we're really pleased that we're doing this event as the kickoff day to the Business Council for Sustainable Energy's 2023 Clean Energy Forum. So we have meetings all day today, this event, and then we have meetings all day tomorrow. So uh, excellent opportunity to bring folks together and learn from this terrific resource. So on the panel, um, I'm going to introduce each panel panelists right now, and then we'll go and hear from them about you know some of the key things that they noticed in the fact book data this year. They might highlight a fact or two and just kind of generally set the stage, what will be, which will be our conversation that follows. So first, to my right is Amy Farrell, Senior Vice President of Government and Public Affairs for CREZ Forum. Next to her is Charles Bolden, Senior Director for Cong of Congressional Affairs for the Solar Energy Industries Association. Next to him is Vincent Barnes, Senior Vice President of Policy and Research for the Alliance to Save Energy. Billy Kamaya, Head of Federal Affairs for the American Clean Power Association. Yvonne McIntyre, Vice President of Federal Affairs for PG&E. Pacific Gas and Electric Corporation, and Jennifer Kane, uh, the Energy Efficiency Policy Leader for Train Technologies. So just an amazing grouping of the different sectors that BCSE represents, and I'm so grateful for them sharing some thoughts with us today. So Amy, let's start with you. Um, love to hear a little bit from you about you know, how you're seeing the year and anything in the fact book that struck your interest. Uh, sure, thank you, um, Lisa. And thank you uh, for the sponsors for uh, including me in this uh, panel presentation today. Um, you know, in looking at the fact book, one of the things that uh, I wanted to focus on is sort of a, a stage setter of where we are with respect to industrial uh, emissions. 
Yeah. Um, if you if you look here, there was a mention now that the power sector emissions have gone down. We see um, a, a relative share of emissions uh, from the industrial sector is is higher um, now. It, Industrial processes count for about 29% of global energy use and one-fifth um, of all global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and in particular, you know, this is concentrated in uh, some six sectors uh, that are energy intensive. Uh, you can see them on the screen, so I'm not going to read them to you. Um, one of the things you talk about what's of note in this moment, and I'm thinking where we are kind of in the world, politically, what's going on the Hill, et cetera. I think this is a really important thing to focus on, uh, in particular because you, uh, China, for example, accounts for 50% of the global steel, cement, uh, chemical production, and nearly 60% of all aluminum. So that's a lot of this in manufacturing production going on in China. Um, and when you think about that uh, in terms of like, global consumption and the embedded uh, emissions in those, um, it's important uh, moment here because when you compare that to the United States, um, you know already the U.S. is competitive from an emissions intensity standpoint. Uh, the average product made in China results in about three times more carbon than one in the United States, um, and so we've got this competitive carbon advantage, and we are now uh, very focused on uh, policies. Uh, that look at ways to increase and improve uh, the emissions efficiency of uh, manufactured products in, in the industrial sector overall. So I guess, you know, the big big picture takeaway that I have on this is, you know, we've seen all the deployment, uh, the, the, the great progress in deployment of clean energy. The clean energy sector is very much already hardwired into the U.S. economy. Um, and now we are uh, have a real... Uh, opportunity here um, when it comes to deploying uh, solutions uh, that will address industrial emissions, things like carbon capture um, and hydrogen uh, deployment. And with that, we'll be poised to increase America's uh, competitive advantage and reduce global emissions. I know there's a lot of focus sometimes on what U.S. emissions are doing, but, you know, we really believe uh, the the global emissions, it's a global global challenge and and these global emission reduction should to be focused on. So we have the opportunity here to take advantage um, of the emissions advantage that uh, U.S. produced resources and goods already have, and then to increase that uh, through the advancement and adoption of technology and, and things that are, are currently being focused on and projected there as a teaser and in, in incentivizing you to go into the fact book after you see this picture, there are a couple of slides that talk about what kind of deployment is expected uh, with respect to hydrogen, and you'll see uh, the projections are a lot of uptake in these very sectors. Uh, there's great information there on the expected uh, cost curve, uh, the, the trajectory for the cost curve on uh, hydrogen technology um, and what that means for adoption. And then similarly, um, there's expected almost 300% increase in uh, carbon capture utilization in storage, um, which creates more opportunity in this space. So that's what I'm my high level three minutes, and then we'll talk more about that, I think, later, right? Yeah, Lisa? I look forward okay. to that. Thanks so much, Amy. Uh, <coughs> Charles, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I uh, just want to say that you and uh, Dan really are doing great things out here. So we really appreciate that. Um, I will be talking about the uh, deployment of solar imports. Um, as you all can see from the the, the pie chart, uh, a vast majority of our imports, uh, approximately $8 billion in total, the vast majority of those comes from countries covered in the Oxen anti-circumvention case. Um, and and from, from this pie chart, you can see Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, um, uh, they're, they're all very much <clears throat> countries in which um, we have seen a lot of our solar imports come from. Uh, with respect to that, um, at, the, at the bar graph, you can see uh, there was a dip uh, very much so in the early part of 2022. Um, but once the president announced the two-year reprieve of the circumvention tariffs, we can also see a spike uh, in, in solar imports. So. Uh, with that being said, we recently released an SMI report um, that shows strong growth in 2023 um, and even stronger growth potentially in 2024. 
Um, so that was really one of the highlights that I took from the fact book. And again, this fact book is something that we all should really uh, look into a lot more and, and, and looking forward to the question that you may have for us. Thanks, Charles. Absolutely. Vincent, welcome to you too. No, thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Dan, and, and Bloomberg as well. It's, it's good to be here. Uh, my name is Vincent Barnes. I'm a Senior Vice President of Policy and Research and Analysis uh, for the Alliance to Save Energy. My focus is primarily going to be on energy efficiency. We have a couple of graphs in front of us. One is relates specifically to energy efficiency resource standards. Those are standards mm -hmm. that states adopt um, to, to, to motivate or accelerate energy efficiency investments within that state um, as a strategy to reduce energy consumption, but also to, um, to, uh, to reduce carbon emissions as well. The second chart that you see um, um, identifies utility energy efficiency spending. Um, um, and as, as, as was mentioned by, uh, uh, earlier um, by, by our Bloomberg rep here, um, uh, you, you can kind of see in the 2019-2020 area where some of that spending level actually goes down. Um, we expect some of that spending level to go up. And so um, how, how, do we, how do we necessarily look at this? We certainly know that, that through the IIJA and through the IRA, we saw historic investments in clean energy in general, and we certainly saw historical investments in energy efficiency more specifically. Um, we saw significant investments in tax incentives, um, uh, 25C, which is designed specifically to motivate consumers who own homes and who itemize, and you can now own two homes and claim the credit. Um, uh, and also for developers um, uh, to, to build uh, uh, Energy Star or better homes. And then also um, uh, tax incentives specifically uh, for commercial, um, both existing and new buildings. And so, so, so those investments there, we're also excited about um, other investments. Primarily, I'm going to mention the, the, uh, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Um, that's a $27 billion investment um, that was, um, that, 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 that's been made by Congress in the, in the future of energy investments, of clean energy investments, primarily in low-income and disadvantaged communities. That's about, it's the, 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 the full total is approximately $27 billion. You have a $7 billion tranche that is specific um, uh, to uh, low-income and disadvantaged communities. We think that, well, not we think, we're pretty sure that's going to go towards solar, uh, community, and rooftop. Um, we also have um, <laughs> um, a, a, another $8 billion that is designed specifically, again, for low-income and, and disadvantaged communities. And that will go toward projects that reduce or eliminate greenhouse gas emissions and can also um, include uh, solar as well. I, I, I mentioned those pieces, that is, the investments in, uh, um, in energy efficiency as part of the IIJ and the IRA, and investments um, uh, uh, more specifically in terms of the uh, Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Because ideally what happens with this is that these investments that have been granted at the federal level are combined and braided with the investments that are happening at the state level. And so it's interesting to see, so, so kind of if, if, if you can take a picture of these two um, graphs now or these, these, these two graphics now, and when we come back next year and, and, and the year after and the year after, it's going to be interesting to kind of see um, um, that growth, particularly on the right in terms of utility um, efficiency spending. The, the anticipation is that utility spending will increase, not decrease, because of the federal, because of the federal spending. Um, that, is, that, 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 that is the intention of these federal investments, to, to supplement but not to supplant um, those investments. Uh, one more piece before I hand it over to Billy, um, and, and, and that is that, that um, we, we certainly understand in energy efficiency um, that um, it has a role um, in U.S. energy and climate policy. In fact, um, the IEA has indicated that energy efficiency alone can, um, can help us achieve 40 percent of the emission reductions that are required by the Paris Agreement. That's energy efficiency alone. That's before we be, we, we've begun to retrofit um, our, supply, um, our, our supply resources. Um, oftentimes, um, it is thought that if we are simply do, doing solar, if we are simply doing wind, um, then we've solved the problem. Um, from our vantage point, we would say that, that, that the energy transition isn't simply a supply problem. It is also a demand problem. And so we have to solve consumption as we solve supply. And, 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 and why that's important, um, just as was mentioned, the cost of supply is going to increase exponentially 
um, based on the direction that policy is currently going. Policy suggests that we'll be plugging more things in in the future than we're plugging in now, which means that we'll have to have a more um, a larger grid and build greater capacity. And if our capacity is primarily going to be renewables, we're going to have to build more of that as well. So these are capital investments that our utilities and others will have to make. Those capital investments are, are generally done over time. Um, um, utilities get paid back for those capital investments over time. The way they get paid back is through their rates. Um, and so if we have to continue to build capacity to meet what we think is going to be an increasing demand, then the price of energy will likely increase. The technology that can help us decrease those costs is energy efficiency. That is, you simply lower the demand. Now, uh, to make a distinction, um, and, and, and for some this may be pedestrians, and for some it may not, um, uh, to make a distinction, this is not turning off your lights when you leave the room. This is not um, closing the refrigerator and, 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 um, and leaving it open too long. This, this is not walking to school or walking to work versus driving your car. This is about technological investments that actually allow your refrigerator to run the way that it runs, but it's using less energy today than it used 20 years ago. It's, it's, it's about your HVAC system running the way that you want it to run at the temperature that you're most comfortable um, uh, while you um, while still using less energy, and um, uh, and, and so it's it, it's it's important as as we as we um, look at the energy transition that we're looking at both supply resources and solutions, but also demand solutions as well. And energy efficiency is the technology to get us there. Thank you, Vincent. Billy, <clears throat> welcome. Let's hear what American Clean Power has to say. Thank you, and thank you. Uh, for this opportunity. So um, the chart or the slide that I, uh, I picked here, um, on the left you'll see cumulative renewable capacity and on the right you'll see uh, generation. As, and as you can see over the last decade, we've pretty much seen a period of growth in the renewable sector year upon year. Um, I, sh I do need to note though, however, that 2022 we saw slightly less growth than we did in 2021. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, I'd say first supply chain, which I think inflicted a lot of industries over the last few years. We saw delays connecting projects to the grid. Um, in the first half of last year, as Charles mentioned, the commerce investigation seriously impacted solar imports. And with the president's waiver, that really interjected some certainty, a transition period for companies, but also some certainty in the market. Um, and then finally, longstanding permitting obstacles. And since we're here in, con in the halls of Congress, if you were to ask me what's one of the key barriers to deploying, uh, rapidly deploying clean power um, and what can Congress do about that, I would suggest permitting reform. And I think there's a pathway to uh, reform the permitting process and maintain um, maintain our environmental laws and guarantee timetables. And there's a way to do that. So um, I would... If I can put a plug in for anything, I would put a plug in for that. Um, the outlook um, going forward is really good. Um, ACP is tracking 135 gigawatts of wind, solar, and energy storage projects in late stage development. Um, we've seen 32 clean energy domestic manufacturing plants announced with 14,000 jobs, uh, 66 billion in announced clean uh, project investments, and 3 billion in electric bill savings for over 17 million Americans. Um, now, this chart really focuses on energy sources, um, but I would remiss if I, I would be remiss if I didn't draw attention to energy storage because we're really seeing a boom in this technology. Uh, last year, we had a record amount of battery storage installed, four gigawatts, which increases the total battery storage capacity by 80 percent. Um, in California, we saw more battery storage installed than any other technology, including solar. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm si Yvonne said I'm stealing her line. Apologies. <laughs> uh, I'll stay away from California. Um, but our outlook for storage is really, really positive. We're tracking over 16 gigawatts in uh, in advanced deployment, late stage deployment. So um, with that, I will pass it over to Yvonne and I'll stop talking about <laughs> California. We, we love to hear about all states. So um, <laughs> it's fine if we hear about California a little bit more. So Yvonne McIntyre with PG&E. Welcome, Yvonne. Hi, thank you, Lisa. And thank you both Lisa and Dan for inviting me to participate in this today. It's uh, been a while since I've done one of these. So happy to be back. Um, 
Lisa said, I'm with Pacific Gas and Electric. We are the gas and electric utility in central to northern California. Um, I'm going to focus today on partly on storage, but, you know, on, on the chart on the left shows that, you know, we are increasingly seeing, you know, a, a prevalence of billion dollar weather um, related, climate related disasters and events. And it's impacting people's power. People are, you know, out of power for a long time um, in many instances and when these events hit. And so what is that driving? Um, it's driving people to look for solutions on how to keep their own power on. Um, and so it is um, really, we're seeing an increase in um, residential solar, uh, excuse me, battery installations. Um, and it's really kind of gone off the charts in years. I mean, California obviously is no stranger to um, extreme weather events. Uh, we, we just in the last three and a half months in December, we had an earthquake in our service territory. And then in the last three um Three months, we've had 13 atmospheric river events. I had never heard that term before until I came to PG&E. Um, but we've had excessive um, torrential rain uh, and hurricane-like winds uh, in the first three weeks of January. And then in the last few weeks, if you've been paying attention, um, just ridiculous amounts of snow. Um, that snow is now melting and on top of us getting rain. So everybody's saying, hooray, you know, we've got... Resolving our drought is, uh, issues in California. No, it's not. It's improved our drought situation by 26%. Um, but now we're having massive flooding. Um, levees are breaking. Um, because of the drought, the soil has been very loosened. So it's bringing down a lot of trees, which are bringing down a lot of power lines. And so um, this is an issue that we're facing. Um, so again, customers are taking it in their own hands, you know, installing storage systems so that they can keep their power on. Um, and it's one thing that, you know, we're, we're actually welcoming um, these, this increased um, um, implementation of battery storage in, in our service territory. Um, in the last year, um, well, as of this last February, um, there are approximately 54,000 PG&E customers that have installed and connected behind the meter battery energy storage system in our service territory, totaling 500 megawatts of capacity. And we're also looking at this as, as a, um, a way that we can help the resiliency and reliability of our system by being able to tap into those systems, not just for customers themselves to restore power to their own homes, but to add power to the grid. We've come up with a couple of um, projects. One, we partnered with Tesla to create a virtual power plant. And so we offer to customers to join this program. We pay them a fee, and then when they're called upon in instances that we know we're going to have a lack of capacity, um, they provide power back to the grid. Last year, um, we had a couple of really bad heat waves um, back in, in August and September, um, and so we deployed a virtual power plant for the first time in August where nearly 2,500 of our customers delivered up to 16 and a half megawatts of um, power back to the grid when we needed it. Um, and by the end of 22, 2022, we have more than um, 4,300 customers that were enrolled. Uh, and they, this virtual power plant was activated 10 times between August and September of 2022. During that heat wave, um, we came very close to what we call, you know, um, to do rolling blackouts because there was a lack of capacity throughout the state. Um, and there's been a lot of solar that has, uh, excuse me, went, yeah battery that has come into the system um, that really saved us. We were, we ended up not having to um, do rolling blackouts, partly because of all the battery storage that came into the system. Also, there was a text that went out by the governor um, at like a very critical time that we were right on the edge asking people to conserve, and they did. Um, and it really, you know, prevented us. So this is just going to be um, continue to increase. California is not the only state that's facing this. Um, we're starting to see Texas. Um, we had a big wildfire in Colorado, so it's, it's spreading throughout the country. These are not just once in a hundred year events anymore. This is prevalent and our systems, our um, utilities have to look for ways to bolster our systems, um, but to also work with our customers to help. Thank you, Yvonne. Yeah. Sorry about all the challenges that um, California and other states have faced in the last year. Gives us pause. Um, Jennifer, Jennifer, great to have you. And thanks for traveling to be with us today. And uh, Jennifer is with Train Technologies. Thank you, Lisa. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, perfect. Um, so like Lisa said, I work for Train Technologies. Uh, we offer a broad range of energy efficient technologies that um, 
go into residential and commercial buildings in addition to transport refrigeration. Um, and what I want to talk about today from the fact book is the status of building energy code adoption throughout the United States. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of different colors on the slide. And the main takeaway from this is that it's not consistent throughout the United States what the mil minimum energy efficiency standards are for all buildings that are being newly constructed or have major renovations being um, undergone. And I, I appreciate a lot of the comments that have already been said because I don't need to talk about why energy efficiency is important. But, um, you know, train technologies, in addition to a lot of the private sector, has climate commitments in order to reduce the amount of emissions that our customers are, are um, putting out into, the, into their buildings uh, with their energy consumption. And so there's a few different levers that can be pulled. Uh, one of them is, you know, ensuring that as new buildings are constructed, they're done so in, a, in an energy efficient way. And so there's a few model codes that exist at a national level that um, help states to adopt uh, kind of standards for energy efficiency. Um, and you can see that, you know, the darker green states have uh, adopted maybe the more recent versions, more energy efficient versions of those codes. And some states are still using previous versions uh, when it goes back to all the way to, you know, uh, 2009 in, in some cases. And so all of these standards are updated every three years. And there's a lot of states that are kind of trailblazers in the path uh, to adopting the most recent version, but there is still a lot of support that's needed for the states that are a little bit farther behind in those energy codes. And so uh, if there's one takeaway that I can leave with you just right now, it's that um, the federal agencies and federal buildings have an opportunity to kind of lead the way and support these states in their adoption and kind of show them how it can be done. And so federal buildings are a perfect example of some of the uh, good ways to practice the most recent energy code adoption, implement building performance standards, which work in complementary fashion to uh, building energy codes because they adjust uh, existing construction as well. And so I, I'm not going to take up too much more time. I'll wait till we get to the uh, questions, but i um, turn it over to you, Lisa. Great. Well, actually, Jennifer, let's follow up on that a little bit. So we obviously passed some very significant pieces of legislation over the last several years that focus on energy efficiency. Is there anything in there that would help states and localities that want to do more on building codes or building efficiency in general? Definitely. So the, between the building infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, there's over a billion dollars allocated to supporting states um, in their adoption of more efficient energy codes. And so in particular, the building infrastructure law is, is dedicated to helping states um, improve their energy efficiency in general. And so that could be through workforce development or technical assistance. Um, and that's over a period of five years. So there's some time to work with that. And the Inflation Reduction Act um, works specifically on implementing the most recent version of these codes. And so that can really help some of those trailblazers too that uh, need additional support um, or are interested in adopting zero energy codes, which is obviously, you know, a really important ask as we start to look into the future and decarbonizing our buildings. And just to kind of set the stage one more time, a fun fact is that the Department of Energy estimates that 75% of the buildings, uh, of buildings that will be newly constructed or renovated by 2035, or they, 75% of buildings will be newly constructed or renovated by 2035. And so, you know, some of the comments that we talked about earlier, if the power grid is decarbonized by that time, you know, and it meets the goals of the administration, uh, we want to make sure that the demand side is uh, reducing their use on fossil fuels in addition to uh, consuming the least amount of energy as possible. Great. Thank you. That was really helpful. I just want to remind folks that may be participating online, if you would like to ask a question, you can email ask at eesi.org. And also for those here, in about 10 minutes, we're going to open it up. We'll have plenty of time for questions from those participating here. So if you have questions, um, get ready. So Yvonne, I wanted to go to you too. I mean, fascinating conversation that you and Billy offered on, on storage. But I also know um, in your um, jurisdiction, very high electric vehicle adoption. I was just wondering if you talk a little bit about the trends in electric vehicles that, you, that you're seeing in PG&E's service territory and kind of how are you thinking it, about it as storage or just part of the energy transition? Sure. Um, it is very exciting. We're all 
excited about, you know, the growth in electric vehicles in our service territory. Um, you know, California has set a goal to, you know, no more um, uh, combustion engine cars uh, sold um, after 2035. And, but there's like serious levels of adoption within our service territory. We have the largest number of electric vehicles in our service territory than anywhere else in the country. Um, we had, there's over 425,000 EVs in, in our service territory. Um, and then nearly one in four of new vehicles sold in our territory last year with an EV. Um, and I know a lot of people kind of are concerned about, well, what does that do to the grid? Is, can the grid handle that? Um, and we're wholeheartedly saying, yes, we can. Um, you know, the, the electricity industry is, is really taking the steps necessary to bolster our grids to be able to add that capacity and, and, and use that. But the other thing that we're looking at um, is how do we use those vehicles to help bolster capacity on our grid? Um, I think everybody's heard, you know, in California, we also have the most solar um, installations than any other state in the country. But guess what? You know, when the sun goes down, all that power comes off at once. And so typically how we make up for that capacity that comes off is, is um, firing up peaker plants, natural gas fire peaker plants. And so what we're looking at is instead of relying on dirtier plants to do that, we're going to rely on all these electric vehicles that are in our territory. Um, and so a, 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 an electric vehicle battery has um, the capability to power a house for three days. A Tesla Powerwall has the ability to do that for three hours, three to four hours. So you can add multiples, you know, but it's going to be a lot of money to do that to be able to power a house for, for three days. So we've entered um, partnerships into partnerships with Ford and GM to test um, bi-directional charging technologies. Um, and so with Ford, we're taking their um, electric lightning um, pickup truck and uh, we're looking at, you know, how does, how is it going to work? How, how can we set up our system to be able to access that, that power um, in the, in the times that we need it. And so just similarly to, um, the types of things that we're doing with uh, the residential battery installations, we're going to offer a, a special rate um, and allow customers to opt into this program. And so when we need to call on, you know, um, extra power being put onto the grid, um, that, that's where we're going to get it from. And so because we have so many um, EVs already in our system, um, you know, it's going to you know, hopefully we'll get most of our um, customers to buy into this program um, that we are not going to have to rely on uh, fossil fuel plants anymore. Um, and we're not going to have to do a lot of more building and so uh, of, of new plants. Um, and so this is going to really kind of help us um, bolster that grid. Um, the um, partnership with GM is actually testing the bi-directional charging um, technology as well. Um, we have this really great uh, testing lab in San Ramon, California, that we test all types of, of equipment from high voltage um, equipment to um, we're doing appliance like um, uh, hood testing. You know, there's a big debate on gas stoves right now. So we're actually testing hoods to see if, you know, you can um, increase the ability to, you know, uh, take up the VOCs that are associated with gas stoves. Um, but this is the other place that we're testing um, the bi-directional charging technology. And so great partnerships. A lot of utilities are, are really, you know, uh, partnering with with the auto industry to um, ensure that we're, we're in this together. We, we want to make the systems work, but we also want to see how they can benefit um, and not just put a burden onto the electricity grid. Thank you. Yeah, amazing what's happening. Um, and you know, I know uh, just in the conversations that I've had with members and others in the industry in the past couple years, just a lot of these concepts have been discussed for a long time, but now we're actually seeing them in the marketplace and we're seeing new partnerships come. And I'm sitting here listening to this panel, you know, you, you forget, really, we've had a tremendous four years of activity in federal uh, energy policy making. And many of most of it's been on a bipartisan basis. Obviously, the Inflation Reduction Act um, was more driven by the Democratic Party, but a lot of the stuff that was in there are things that have had bipartisan support for many years, including a lot of the tax incentives that were in there. And and certainly, I think the um, 
priorities of Republicans to broaden the menu of the types of activities that we support through the tax code what was represented in the in the Inflation Reduction Act. But, you know, when we couldn't imagine those bills having passed, um, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act or the Energy Policy Act that was passed the year before, or the Chips and Science Act. Our industries were saying, you know, A, we need we need support and we need more partnership from the federal government to help communities, to help the private sector, to help states and regions move forward with the energy transition. But what we really need is predictability. We need policy certainty and we need policies that are not just one or two years, but that could satisfy the project cycles of many technologies. And there are many technologies that need more than one or two years to move through um, the project investment and construction cycle. So those things were were in large part addressed. And now, Charles, you're going to be like, she said all this, but why is she going to come to me? But, mm -hmm. you know, in your comments that you made just now, looking at the experience of the solar industry last year, you know, you saw um, a disruption, right? And then there was an action taken, in this case, by the Biden administration that caused a, a, a calming, a, a slight reprieve from the disruption that you were experiencing. So I was just wondering if you could talk about how your industries are feeling as we approach 2023. I mean, maybe on trade, not fully resolved, but are they feeling that there's a little bit more predictability? And how important is policy certainty for investment in the industries that you work in? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I'll say first, first of all, we, we've, we've been putting out fires lately, um, but, but, I think that when it comes to things that support domestic manufacturing, like that is something that we want to continue to let members of Congress know and policymakers know that the, when, when we put policies out that let us get the um, assurance of where America will be in the next few years, uh, domestic manufacturing and bringing jobs back to America, um, but also the jobs that these uh, policies create, they will change districts, they'll change lives, they'll make a huge economic impact. Um, so I think that that is something that a lot of our member companies are focusing on, um, is how do we bring back more domestic manufacturing? But we do understand that the supply chain is still, uh, with the current capacity levels, that we still have to figure out how we can depend, not not on China, but other countries as well, um, and, and, and as well as bringing those uh, jobs here to the United States. So. I think policy is definitely shaping up and has been in our favor. However, we continue to face different challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. So, Thank you. Well, I'll come back to that because there might be some suggestions for, for Congress that you're thinking about in that context. Billy, I'd love to go to you. I mean, you can make a comment on the policy certainty part if you'd like, but I'd also love to hear from you. You mentioned permitting and siting, and obviously we're, we're here at the offices of the House of Representatives, and in the next few weeks, we're expecting one of maybe several energy bills that are going to move forward. And I know for the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, that is a very high priority for us, this Congress. And uh, you know, I just want to know if you want to expound on that a little bit more. But also, too, if there's anything, as you look back over the last few years on kind of the goals that you had and what kind of policy certainty we have or don't have at this moment. So. Sure. Um, certainly the um, Inflation Reduction Act gave us um, a decade of tax um, policy certainty, and we're seeing those those market signals are impacting the outlook that I talked about today with regards to solar manufacturing and investment in clean energy projects. Um, so we're really seeing a boom, boom in that. Um, I think that to realize the full benefits of that, um, permitting reform is going to have to be a, a part of that because, frankly, we need to build. We need to build plants. We need to build transmission lines. There's there's a lot. Um, HR1 um, that will be moving through the House, um, I think, makes uh, has some really important pieces in it, specifically related to uh, reforming NEPA. Um, I think there is more uh, that can be had, and I think once the House passes their bill, we'll see what the Senate adds to it. Um, we're certainly hoping there's um, some movement to help build transmission lines, um, but we are really supportive of the process, and we're happy to see that the House took this up so early in this Congress. So. Yeah, that's great. Just, just to piggyback off what Billy just said, when it comes to transmission lines, I feel that um, the responsibility that we have to do when it comes to policies in that in that realm 
uh, would, would definitely have to take and consider uh, the environmental justice impacts and the equity. We want to make sure that we're doing it the right way. Um, so just want to make sure that while we think of transmission, we want to make sure that we're doing it in a just and equitable way. No, I appreciate that. And worthy of a whole conversation in and of itself, which I'm sure ESI will will lead because um, it's just so important to unpack what you just said, Charles. Um, I, Amy, I wanted to see if you wanted to comment on any of the en energy legislation um, that the Republican leadership here in the House is involved in, anything that you're prioritizing, something, things that you're hoping to get accomplished. Um, yeah, thank you. I think that, um, you know, we, we too see this as a, 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 a positive and, and a, a strong first step. The, uh, you know, the, the House pl plan, the Republicans plan, it, it's multifaceted. It's about investing in innovation, unlocking domestic resources, and the, the, the letting, you know, having things, you know, let us build the permitting reform piece. And so we're, uh, you know, we were glad to see uh, that out and that move, move moving forward. Um, as I mentioned uh, in my initial remarks, you know, we think that the, there's real opportunity and alignment between um, emission reductions, global emission reductions, and the, the type of uh, modernizing of permitting that will allow increased build out of, of clean energy, uh, increased access to our uh, critical energy resources in the U.S. and that's securing the supply chain and so forth. And so uh, a lot of these 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 goals align. Um, and I, I would I, I think it's an, it would encourage folks not to get put into this like false choice, you know, that there's a trade off between, um, you know, b between environment and um, in in energy uh, production and national security. I mean, it's all the legs of the school. The stool. We need the affordability. We need the um, emissions. Um, the the emissions uh, component to be there, and then we also I need this focus on um, energy security. So, um, yeah, we see this as a a very positive thing and a, and um, you know a, a, a good step. And yeah, I'll. I'll I'll leave it at that. Okay. Well, we'll come back to you. Um, we're going to, I'm going to take one, do one more question from up here, but then we're going to open it up to questions. So get ready if you have one. Vincent, um, Jennifer talked a little bit about building codes, but beyond, again, these very significant pieces of legislation that have been enacted, and I know you're working feverishly like we all are to, to help design the programs that are included in them, you know, are there other things that you would recommend that Congress do to support energy efficiency? Yeah, certainly, Lisa, don't want to <clears throat> understate the, um, the value of IRA and IIJA. I mean, historic in terms of energy efficiency investments. Um, having said that, if, 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 if we're, the, the way that we're looking at IRA and IIJA, and IIJA investments, um, first, bills on energy efficiency long overdue, um, but what they do provide is they provide a baseline or, or what, or in um, Yvonne's parlance, um, they give us base load capacity. They may keep us humming for a while, right? Um, in terms of um, what we need to do, um, um, as part of the energy transition, that is energy efficiency carrying its load. Um, but if there's a if, if there's an additional step that we could have taken in the IRA, and certainly a step that we should be looking toward um, um, post IRA, and, and, and Yvonne uh, touched on this some as well, um, that would be with um, investments in demand flexibility and in GEBS as well. What what are GEBS? Um, so uh, uh, grid integrated efficient buildings. Okay, um, thank and, you. And so those are, and so, and so Yvonne talked about virtual power plants. What demand flexibility, we call it active efficiency at the Alliance to Save Energy. Some also call it digital energy efficiency. It is about the ability of technologies to communicate, to make equipment and homes and buildings more efficient. And so if you're using bi-directional charging, um, that is, curiously enough, a, a demand flexibility type technology. It is about, uh, think about this, we're not there yet, but the technology is going to get us there if we make the investments. But, but demand flexibility is about a building's ability to shift, share, and shed load on a regular basis, a community's ability to shift, share, and shed load, um, a home's ability, um, even inside your, uh, not there yet, think about appliances and equipment having that ability to shift, share, and shed load. Um, working with your utility, working working um, with businesses, working with commercial, working with industrial, you add all of those, you, you add demand flexibility into all of those different pieces, 
um, and and you 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 actually optimize or maximize um, the, the already placed energy efficiency investments. So that's what we would like to see. We think the next big step, one of the next big steps in energy efficiency, is investments in demand flexibility. A lot of that is on the utility side, um, but a lot of that is on the consumer side as well. I see Jennifer shaking her head. Any any com comments on that that you want to add? No, I, I agree with everything that you said. Um, one one thing to consider is that there's a, a new trend to implement building performance standards. So I had alluded to it previously, but it's a way for larger commercial buildings to have targets to reduce their energy consumption over time. And so it would really stress the importance um, of that there's a national coalition right now. I think it has about over 30 cities and a few states and a couple states that have already implemented this and cities. Um, so really stressing the importance of uh, getting those policies in place. Um, and that might include a potentially benchmarking policy prior to actually setting the targets for uh, reduced emissions because you can't, you know, you can't reduce the energy if you don't know how your energy is being used. And so there's a lot of different policies that are in place right now and up and coming that can work in conjunction with all of the funding that is being presented at the IRA. So a lot of times those those energy efficiency improvements might also be able to qualify for a tax credit. And so it's uh, there's a, a lot of different moving parts, but would really just stress the, imp the importance of getting those policies in place. Great. Thank you. Well, as promised, we'd love to open it up to some questions from <clears throat> people in the room. Anyone have a question? And if, okay, I see one here. And if you could please introduce yourself. And we have, oh, great, we have some from online too. Wait, well, Mike is coming to you. Thanks very much. My name is Jared Blum. I happen to serve as chair of ESI. and want to tell you all how thrilled I am about this program this afternoon. And, and many of you on the panel, I know personally, and thank you for making the time to come see us. Um, I'm thrilled by the kind of progress we've made in terms of implementing a lot of the technologies we, you guys are talking about in terms of production technology and efficiency technology. But data shows that between the production of the energy and the utilization of the energy, there's a tremendous amount of loss, some estimates up to two thirds. Can any of you talk to the issue of how we upgrade, can we upgrade the grid and, and enhance the efficiency of the actual delivery? Is that something that any tech, any uh, particular industry is looking at to try and be more efficient in how we actually transmit the electricity? Anyone, I also want to say, uh, Ethan, you're welcome to answer any questions you like. I, we will pull up a chair for you if you want to comment. We'd love to have your input. But anybody on the panel want to want to talk about that? Look, I, I would say that that's an energy efficiency issue, really. If, 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 our, if our energy is being produced more efficiently, that is, we're, 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 there, are, there are fewer energy inputs to produce that energy, um, um, that, 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 that's really what we're working toward. And so um, while it may not fully be an energy efficiency issue, um, there are technologies that can make the production of energy more efficient. Um, th th it, it can happen at the manufacturing level when you're producing the solar panels. It can happen at the oil and gas level when you're, when, when you're, when you're pulling the oil out of the ground. It can happen in the distribution chain when you're moving from upstream to downstream. Uh, energy efficiency can actually be pushed into all of those stages of processing and development um, to actually extract, um, uh, to, to, to lose the, or, or avoid the waste. That's the word I'm looking for, to avoid the waste in terms of, um, in, in terms of energy production. Um, we're not the full answer in terms of, in, in terms of um, 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 greater efficiency in how energy is produced, but we are certainly part of the answer. But part, part of, so it, it, it's, it's a, delivery issue, right? So you have tremendous line losses in the power lines themselves Bingo. from production to end use. And it's a materials issue, right? And so, you know, currently they're copper wires um, and, you know, they get hot. So you're like, you're losing your energy that way. Um, so there are efforts. I don't know, it, you know, I know materials experts are working on it. Department of Energy is looking at it. So there are those efforts um, out there, uh, but it, it's it's something that this industry has um, tried to deal with for many, many, many moons. Um, nobody's cracked that nut yet, but they keep trying. So I, I figured with this group, you guys would know something. Do you want to comment? It and we need to do more work on. It. Yeah, I know three three M at one point have been um, looking at you know more yeah. So Thank you. somebody's out there. I would, I would say like I was at a briefing 
earlier today where this very thing came up, and there, there's actually um, uh, in in DOE, DOE's loan program office, there's one program specifically focused on um, uh, investments at existing facilities to do just this type of of, of work, um, and and then there's obviously um, uh, offices and investments looking at uh, broader uh, transmission technology and improvements and opportunities. So it's it's definitely part of the whole um, picture, uh, part of the part of the all of the above. Uh, check. Well, I would like to take a question from our online audience. We have a few. This first one, and I can't believe we really haven't talked about this much. And I would love to invite Ethan in if he wants to say anything about it. Hydrogen. We haven't really talked about it as much as I thought we might have yet, but obviously, you know, connects to all the industries at the Business Council for Sustainable Energy. I mean, the question was very general, you know, what's the outlook for, for hydrogen? And I know uh, there were a tremendous amount of uh, incentives in the last several research, development, and deployment legislation, as well as tax credits for hydrogen. A lot of conversations kind of going back to the slide that Amy put up there, how many different sectors could benefit potentially from hydrogen, clearly industrial, transportation, perhaps buildings, power. I mean, it, it, what do they call it? It's the key that unlocks everything or some <laughs> something like that. So is that true? You know, how are you all looking at hydrogen? Does anyone want to pop in first? Go ahead. Um. Well, Ethan could probably talk to the overall projection. I mean, I know if you if you look and encourage you to look in the 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 deck. I mean, I think slide fifty seven in particular, Scott, um, a slide on on the projected outlook and looking at the demand, but also looking at the you know the trends in uh, twenty twenty two electrolyzer shipments and and a few slides ahead of that. It talked about the it talks about the costs. Uh, current costs and the and the expected drop in costs for both uh, uh, blue and green hydrogen production. Um, so the outlook on that is is good. The it, currently the in, in industry is is small, but again expected to significantly um, uh, scale and grow. Um, we see that as I mentioned before as an opportunity um, when it comes particular to the industrial processes. Tons of tons of opportunity on that front. Um, but also, you know, I kind of jotted a note to myself too, where you were talking about the storage challenges. So uh, another thing that came up, there's the, um, the ACES, uh, Delta project in Utah, right? I'm looking at Rebecca who knows everything, um, about all this stuff here. Um, and the, that, for example, from a storage, like one salt cavern in that is 150 gigawatt hours of storage. So this is, this is real game changer type stuff, both from a energy storage, um, uh, from an energy storage standpoint, also a uh, real opportunity when it comes uh, to fuel source and use when we're looking at um, our chemical, industrial, cement, that, that those major sectors, um, real opportunity there. So um, not, an, again, no panacea for everything, but as we look at each piece of the parts of the economy and opportunities to both reduce emissions and compete um, uh, globally, I think hydrogen is going to be a, a big piece of that puzzle. And there, yeah, you know, there was funding in the IIJA for hydrogen hubs. There's tax credits in IRA for hydrogen. Everybody's going after this money. I mean, it, it, it's as you said. I mean, the, this is like you know the the you know the star that everybody's like going to try to crack. Um, and so you know we we have a project that we're collaborating on in northern california california as a state has gone after the hub you know to become one of the hubs um we made uh um some pretty aggressive climate goals uh last year um said we're we're a gas utility and so you know we're we we've, we've made some commitments to substantially reduce our emissions in the gas system um and part of that is you know putting hydrogen into our lines um, the industrial sector is one of the hardest sectors to decarbonize, and so that's where you know you're looking at. They use gas, uh, natural gas, as a feedstock for a lot of their processes right now. You know, can you use um, hydrogen in its stead? So it is it is something that across the country everybody is looking at and investing in. 
Billy, comments? Yeah, I just want to add, and I agree with the comments here. This is a growing field where our members are investing more into green hydrogen. But I wanted to draw attention to Senator Coons and Cornyn just introduced a package of four bills aimed to um, boost hydrogen. One specifically is called HIFIA, which would create a financing, uh, a pilot financing program for grants um, and loans. And, you know, if you're interested in hydrogen, I would certainly take a look there. No, that's that's great. Um, I don't know, Ethan. Did you have any comments you'd like to make? You can come stand here, and I'll move aside. Uh, I mean, I'll just. I think those are all the right points. I, I um, and definitely uh, I agree with Yvonne in particular that for hydrogen, you know, in our view, the most likely and, and important application is around these industrial processes. And I showed that chart, and you know, we have not seen real progress on reducing CO two emissions from the um, industrial sector. So that's the most likely, and there's certain things about making cement or steel that you require incredible heat, and it's just hard to provide that um, without burning something, and better to burn something that produces no CO2 emissions. Uh, in our view, you know, the, 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 you know, the IRA is potentially, you know, monumental in this area. It offers up to potentially $3 per kilogram for the production of hydrogen, uh, based on our own, you know, BNF's projections, and this isn't a fact. This is, you know, all, you know, our projection based on what we see of of um, the supply of the equipment to make hydrogen. You know, you, you literally could have a situation where three dollars is more than the cost of actually producing hydrogen. In other words, you're 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 literally you're literally paying people to the federal government would potentially be paying people to produce hydrogen. The challenge between now and then is that, that actually one thing that isn't in the IRA is anything that really drives a whole lot of demand for green hydrogen. And so I think that's one area to potentially look at. I think the, the hubs idea and, and the, the money that's going to go um, under the infrastructure law help, might help drive demand, and that, that could be quite helpful. Um, but I think there's, you know, there's a lot of unanswered questions. And the last thing I'll say is you know, you know, the definition of what is green hydrogen is not a straightforward um, question. And it is one that the Treasury Department will have to address when they write rules around how this tax credit works. Um, you know, is your hydrogen green if uh, the, uh, you have a solar plant uh, and a battery right next door to where you make the hydrogen and all it does is provide the power? Is your hydrogen green if you buy power off the grid, grid to run your operations um, and you happen to operate in a state which is 75% renewable power. Um, these, are, these are not clear questions to, to answer. Do you need to match 100% of the power you use with the hour that it's produced? So in other words, is every electron that you use green at the moment that you use it? These are not questions that um, have ever really had to be sorted out fundamentally. And so um, the rules, uh, which, I, which I think are supposed to come sometime in August, but we'll see if Treasury hits that deadline, that will really um, define a lot about um, about how you know the hydrogen industry uh, can grow in the U.S. Very helpful, thank you. We have time. Oh, this gentleman here, please introduce yourself. And a mic is coming. Yes, Kevin Killian. I'm a regular citizen, oh, except I don't have you. representation because I'm a D.C. resident. <laughs> <laughs> With you. So I have a question about the a power plant. I thought they were phasing out uh, net metering. So is it like a, a power purchase agreement? And um, because uh, trucks and SUVs uh, uh, contribute to the ma majority of the fatalities on the road, could you make it a smaller uh, payment for them than for regular cars? The, the, you said something about power purchase, or you said something about a power plant. And I, I like the term developer better. Like anybody can be a developer if they have renewable. Okay. And also energy efficiency. You know, we can we can grow it. We can grow it all. Any comments on virtual power plants? A little bit more detail on how they worked, at least in the setting that you um, are in. Yep. So we, like I said, we have one already set up um, with Tesla, and um, so we. <sighs> Customers sign up with us. We we um, and and so then we request when we 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 find out that we have a, a need a, a capacity shortage. Then we put the call out that they you know put the power back onto the grid and and they receive two dollars for every 
incremental kilowatt hour of electricity that discharges during the event. They can opt out. Like if they're just like, eh, I'm afraid my power is going to go out. Do I need it for here? But um, so that that's the one that we already have going. Um, we just announced last month uh, a partnership with Sunrun um, that uh, it, it is a special program just for summer reliability. Um, so Sunrun will enroll up to 7,500 um, residential home solar and battery systems in our in our service territory that will be capable of discharging 30 megawatts back to the grid during times of constraint. Um, they will be, if, if you're enrolled in, in the program, uh, they'll be directed to discharge every day from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. during the month of August through October. So that that's that window that we really need it when, when the sun goes down. Um, and then in exchange, they'll receive an upfront payment, $750 and a free smart thermostat. Um, and they will, and we're going to ensure that they'll, they'll return, they'll retain enough energy for their own personal use um, while they're also providing power to the grid. So from that example, it sounds very on the ground and community level focused. You know, this will probably be our last question. Is there anything, maybe I'll give you all a chance just to say one final quick word, but is there anything that Congress can do or need or federal um, regulatory <coughs> bodies need to do to help make more of that happen? Or is it really just at this, the state decision or local decision level? Anyone have a comment on that? So, you know, I, I think the policy is already, you know, providing the incentives for people to continue to install, um, you know, the deployment of, the, of these technologies to, to um, for us to be able to utilize them as well. So that's one thing um, at the federal level, you know, that's the most important thing right now. State level, it's always a matter of, you know, how do we, how do we structure our rates? How do we structure the programs to be able to attract our customers to be part of them? And that has to have regulatory approval. So we have to go through the CPUC. I will say we are in the state of California that is very much bought into all of this, that have very um, aggressive um, emissions reductions goals. And so, you know, we, we tend to find um, a good partnership with our regulators out there on programs like this, but it is always a challenge of we have to figure out the right rate structure um, that's going to get regulatory approval. Thank you. Anybody else have a comment on that? Well, right. least, my, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, my comment isn't direct, but <clears throat> I, I think it's worth noting that um, our discussion today has been primarily about um, fulfilling the capacity need. Um, that is the amount of clean energy we'll, we will need, the amount of solar, the amount of wind, the, the amount of green or blue hydrogen. And, and from a policymaking perspective, um, particularly since we are doing this particular briefing on the Hill, um, um, uh, by, by way of EESI, um, I think from a policymaking perspective, as if, at least from this point forward, we should be thinking energy efficiency first. That is, what is the size of the problem that we have to solve? That is, what is our energy demand? And how can that energy demand be reduced and then build from there? Um, if we are not first tackling this um, from, um, from a perspective of energy efficiency first, we may actually have to spend more to build mm -hmm. the capacity that we need. And so if we're being purposeful and strategic in terms of what energy costs are going to be for consumers once we get to the other side of the transition, and if we're going to be strategic in terms of um, how much of our land is covered with solar or how much of our land is covered with wind, wind or how much of our oceans are covered um, um, by wind, um, we should first look at energy efficiency. How can we lower demand? And the technology is there to answer a good part of that question. So it, we're, we're not talking about a brand new technology. We are talking about an existing technology that is consistently being improved. Very important to keep in mind. We have a few minutes, like two minutes left before we close. But any last thoughts, something burning that you didn't get to say that you wanted to say? Start down this way, slowly go down. Anybody? Amy? Charles? Vincent? Silly? I would just, um, oh, please, after you. Oh, you, are we, are we, you can go first, then I'll go. Sure. go I went too yeah. fast. Okay. Uh, um, I thought you were just, yeah, okay. No, <laughs> I was going like this to see if anyone perked. All right. Charles goes first, then to you, Amy, and then we'll proceed. I would just say one of the one of the major issues that I that I find interesting um, as my time working in renewables is, or specifically for solar, um, is the equity piece, the, the justice, the environmental justice aspect. Um, when we talk about the 
the health implications or health disparities that we've seen uh, across the country in low and in low income and minority communities, I feel that I have an obligation to speak up on it. Um, and one of the things that I would like to say when it comes to renewable energy is that for far too long in, in these communities, we've seen health disparities. Respiratory issues have been leading uh, leading killers amongst uh, minority communities for a long time. Um, and I say all that to say um, that the more that we, solar that we deploy, the more hydrogen, the more um, wind, uh, the less that these communities will be impacted. Benson talked about uh, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Right now there's a bill that is uh, being pushed uh, in HR1 actually to repeal the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Um, and, and I just want to say to that point, we, we must uh, bring the health implications um, from these communities as well as when we look at the taxpayer dollars that some of these communities are facing when it comes to uh, hospital bills and things of that nature, to be proactive in this space is the best way to go forward. So please put equity, please put diversity uh, in the forefront of these conversations when it comes to renewable energy. Charles, I just want to uh, uh, piggyback on something that you said about um, health um, um, concerns um, inside low-income and disadvantaged communities, and 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 certainly the the, the relation uh, to, to to solar. Um, I, I I appreciate you leaving the opening. Uh, to, 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 that it really is energy efficiency that solves <laughs> a lot of those air quality issues inside the home, air sealing the home, ensuring that the HVAC system is working the way that it needs to. Absolutely. Um, the, the the capacity issue um, and and the greenhouse gas reduction fund fortunately um, provides that seven billion dollar investment <coughs> that will get some of these solar installments into low income and disadvantaged communities. Um, but it is essential that um, um, not not everyone will choose solar. Not everyone will go solar. Um, but one of the and that's okay. We, yeah, one, <laughs> and, but one of the ways to ensure that we are improving the health. Um, of individuals inside their homes, particularly in low-income and disadvantaged communities, um, is through energy efficiency investments. And the data proves that out, actually. It's all about the portfolio, right? I mean, that we all have something to contribute. Um, yeah, very, I know we have to close. We're to pretty much over, like, no one said 10, 20 seconds down here. Any any co last comments? Can I just I want to piggyback yeah. on that as well. I mean, you know, when you look at electrification, transportation, um, building, you know, all of that, you know, you, you are transforming, you know, a lot of disadvantaged communities are next to highways. And what, so you're, you're taking those vehicles off the road, replacing them with non-emitting vehicles. So you're, you're, you're addressing a lot of the disadvantaged community issues. Um, and again, electric, I shouldn't be saying this because I'm, I'm a gas utility too, but you know, <laughs> you, you, you take away some of those issues as well as you electrify buildings and homes. Okay, Amy, you get the last word before Dan comes up to close us out. Okay, I will just add, you know, we have to think about the fact that we're in a global community as well, and everything out there shows there's going to be an increased global demand uh, for energy. And because of that, we have to think about the right now and where can we uh, produce the right the, the, the energy in a way that we've got an emissions uh, advantage in how it's produced. And that's part of the, the produce more angle that we're looking at. And the reason we need to keep looking at um, all these technologies, be it in the, the renewable space, the hydrogen space across the board, is that we are, we are looking at solving these technology and innovation challenges so we can have a space where um, globally there's not that trade-off between affordability, reliability, um, and uh, emissions, taking that all into account. So that'll be my, my last word. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I'll just say, you know, the last several years, despite, as, as Ethan said, very weird um, years uh, for many reasons and, and some really challenging and difficult times here in Congress, you know, and there too has been challenging, but a lot of really strong bipartisan legislation. And I think I hope that that's what we'll continue with over the next several years. And the Business Council for Sustainable Energy wants to be a resource. So thank you, um, ESI. Thank you to our audience here, our audience online. I'm going to let Dan close us out. Thank you. <laughs> This is kind of fun. I just float in at the beginning and then float in at the end, um, and I get to listen to really great presentations. So um, I, I have to start by acknowledging any time we mention building energy codes, it's you know top of my list of favorite briefings. So thanks very much for that. Um, I think our panelists uh, deserve a round of applause for their excellent presentations today.
and I think our friends at the Business Council for Sustainable Energy also uh, um, deserve our applause as well, uh, combined with uh, with Ethan and Bloomberg NEF for bringing the Sustainable Energy Factbook uh, to us once again this year. So thank you so much. It's um, uh, this is the I don't even know how many years we've done this brief. Eleven. Uh, well, OK, I have to believe I've been around for three and a half. So um, this is a great briefing and it really is a tremendous resource. The amount of work that goes into putting these slides together in the fact book, it's uh, it's a it's a lot of work, but it's really worth it. If anyone hasn't visited, I don't like to send people to other websites other than ESI.org, but I'll make an exception. If you haven't gone to BCSE.org yet and downloaded the fact book, you really ought to because it's what, 150 ish, maybe 140 ish maybe 80-ish, oh, somewhere, somewhere between one and a million uh, slides uh, that really give you some really excellent snapshots. I haven't looked at it yet, I'll admit. I haven't done it yet. Uh, but it's a really excellent set of snapshots for the um, uh, energy sector in the United States and where things are going. So thank you so much for that. Um, I also get to say a few uh, additional thank yous. Um, uh, I, you know, Lisa, of course, Ruth, Laura, everyone on Team BSE, always really, really tremendous to work with you, whether it's here or in Egypt or soon to be uh, United Arab Emirates. Um, so thank you so much for, for helping us with this briefing today. Thank you also to everyone on Team EESI. Uh, I'd like to thank Omri, Dan O'Brien, Allison, Emma, Molly, Anna, uh, Tyler, and of course, Troy, our intrepid videographer. Uh, for helping to bring this uh, briefing to everybody today. Uh, we'll close it out. Um, we have a, a reception starting shortly, which will be fun. So I hope everyone has a chance to uh, stick around. And thank you once again to Amy, Charles, Vincent, Billy, Yvonne, and Jennifer for a set of really great, excellent presentations today. Thank you. We'll close there.